I'm Alena Dobrorodnyva. I will be moderating the design panel today. And I want to introduce you our guest from Austria. Rihanna Lenin, please. Rihanna is uh, working on development of creating industries. She works with many countries. Uh, she is involved in exchange of experience uh, in design and technologies with other countries. And today she will tell us how technologies influence our lives. She will tell us what we can expect from those influences and how we should behave in this regard. So, good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's a big pleasure to be here with you today uh, at the You Tomorrow Summit and a big honor as well. Uh, it's been a while since I've been traveling and it's wonderful that the first stop was Kiev. I have really been enjoying the summit so far. It has been so inspiring and so wonderful to meet all these people and to hear your stories. And I am really happy that I can contribute a little bit as well. So I think, let me check if I do it correctly. No. Ah, yes. <laughs> so behind me, you see a picture of me at the age of seven. I used to spend a lot of time on board of container ships at that time because my father used to be a technical engineer. And while spending time on board of these ships, I used to be surrounded by hot, steaming and loud machines and also by a lot of marine technology. And at the same time, uh, being far away from home and uh, being in the middle of nowhere at high sea, but also having the opportunity to visit far away places and get in touch with uh, sometimes quite exotic cultures has uh, sparked my interest for the nexus between technology and uh, creativity. Uh, nowadays, I think one could say that I am an arts and culture junkie. And what I really like is when I walk through a museum uh, that you really feel and uh, think about what influence innovation and technology has had on artists and art all over the ages. Uh, when thinking about Van Gogh and the Impressionists, for example, uh, the invention of the portable paint tube um, made it possible for them to paint outside for the very first time, which had a huge impact on the art world. Also inventions of tools such as the photo camera that made it possible to capture the moment in ways that hadn't been possible before had a big impact. And also the discovery and the invention of the printing press had, of course, big implications because artists and authors had the chance to publish and spread their works. And also uh, the, uh, scientists could communicate their discoveries. Uh, technology and creativity go hand in hand and they complement each other. And they make us more creative and more productive. And they also constantly reshape and redefine the, the perspective we have on life. Uh, creativity and technology have become more and more intertwined over the ages and over the past decades. And uh, this shows itself, for example, in, in new methods to combine different types of media but also by enabling human interaction with the art or by giving us new methods and processes to be more creative. And uh, technology and creativity, they have a huge impact on each other, not just in the art world, but also in movie making, fashion, music. And today I have the honor to tell you a bit more about the Austrian ecosystem because I am from Austria and to uh, give you some examples of Austrian organizations and startups that have influenced the way how creativity and technology uh, mix and match with each other and how art and creativity is being created. 
Let me start with giving you a glimpse into the Austrian art world. Uh, Austria has a very multifaceted art industry. Um, the Viennese Impressionism, Viennese Modernism and Secession um, that actually exist since the start of the 20th century are still the main art movements in Austria. And uh, nowadays, uh, Austria, Austria is on the forefront when it comes to finding uh, innovative solutions to the challenges the international art world is facing today. Art, uh, the art world and the art industry is both a content generator and a content provider, and they are hugely uh, influenced by uh, digitization and innovation and technology. The Ars Electronica Center, which has opened its doors 42 years ago, is strongly working in this field on the crossroads between arts, uh, technology and humanity. And uh, they spend a lot of time uh, when it comes to discovering new technologies. They used to be like a telescope when they were founded 42 years ago, offering glimpses in the far future and in what technology is going to bring us. And nowadays they position themselves more like um, a compass and they guide us through new technologies. And they are, going, they are showing us what is going to happen in our lives because of technology. And they, um, they have a strong focus on artificial intelligence, on automated, uh, automatization, on robotics and on biotechnology. And they closely work together with um, artists, with scientists, with entrepreneurs and with activists to uh, show what is possible in the near future. Apart from being an institution that is uh, well known internationally, it's actually also a physical space that you can visit to see interactive artworks. And uh, you can visit um, workshops and labs there, and there is a lot of scientific research going on. And they are also the host of uh, an international new media art festival, uh, which takes place every year in September, the next one opening its doors in just a few days' time. Another very interesting startup when talking about art and technology is called Artivive. And they have made a business out of um, uh, enhancing two-dimensional artworks with, uh, art, uh, with augmented reality technology. Uh, the user only needs to download the free Artivive app and point the camera at the artwork, and then they already see the, dim the digital dimensions of it. So, for example, the artist could enhance the artwork with a video of... Um, of um, how the, the artwork came about, or of uh, the sketches, the original sketches of the, the work of art. And also, some of the artists incorporate augmented reality right from the beginning, and they combine uh, augmented reality with uh, analog art. And right now, Artivive has a community of around 100,000 artists all around the world, and uh, they come from 120 countries. I would also like to briefly mention Tonio, which is an app that connects television and radio with uh, your mobile phone. And they are called the audio QR code of tomorrow, so to say. So they uh, give uh, broadcasters the chance to send out background information or photos or videos or uh, promotional campaigns. And for example, they also have a cooperation with the Vienna State Opera and they send out uh, subtitles that correspond to the, to the recitals that are performed on stage. So let me also tell you something about fashion and uh, about the Austrian fashion industry. Also here one could say that uh, the business successes of companies today are rooted in, in accomplishments of the past. Uh, around the turn of the 20th century, Vienna used to be a very uh, vivid uh, textile center, and there were a lot of, um, of uh, tailors that worked with these textiles. 
Also nowadays, uh, Vienna and Austria uh, has a lot of companies that are working on the crossroads between fashion and technology. And one uh, best practice example, I would say, is Julia Körner. Um, she works with generative uh, design tools and with uh, 3D pin printing technology. And she does this across the disciplines, not just in fashion, but also in um, architecture and product design. And uh, she has uh, designed the costumes of the Hollywood, Hollywood blockbuster uh, Black Panther from the year 2018. And she actually won an Oscar with that in the year 2019 for best costume design. And for this, she combined uh, top-notch top technologies with tr traditional approaches. Another startup I really like is called IFDAC, which is uh, an AI-driven tool. Uh, and on the basis of in-depth analytics, they, um, they can answer any question in relation to uh, the fashion industry. For example, uh, market value, impact, power, of uh, fashion models, fashion uh, magazines, but also designs and brands. And uh, with the help of IFDAC, um, fashion and lifestyle stakeholders can answer the questions they might want to pose tomorrow already today. And the third company I would like to mention here is called Yokai Studios. Uh, they used to start off as a European research project and uh, their aim was to bring fashion production back to Europe. But by now they are a startup strongly focusing on technology and especially on, on industrial robotics. They aim to design, produce and present uh, fashion products and garments uh, in a sustainable, local and uh, sustainable way. And uh, while doing this, they also put a strong focus on the challenges we have right now concerning pollution and CO2 emissions. Um, I would also like to tell you something about the Austrian film industry. Um, they are also uh, quite successful internationally uh, in the 92-year history of the Oscar Awards, for example. Uh, Austrian movies have been, uh, have been nominated for the Oscar for 113 times and they have actually won one 37 times. And you might all know The Sound of Music, which was set in the Austrian mountains and which was a success especially in Asia and in the States. And another uh, successful export product from Austria was or is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, but of course, there is much more to it than that. Uh, there are also a lot of innovative startups and organizations working in uh, like virtual production, such as the virtual production studio Vienna. They are a mobile um, a film, broadcast and streaming studio that combine uh, state-of-the-art rendering, heart and software. Um, with uh, high-resolution LED walls, new uh, media technologies and a highly sensitive grid of uh, tracking cameras. And this combination is actually of Hollywood quality and it means a big uh, like revolution in the European film industry. And the good thing is that their services also work in a virtual space which means that also independently of, uh, of health and travel issues, you, you can work together with them. Another interesting company uh, is Bitmovin. They are working in the field of uh, video in infrastructure and they work together with uh, online uh, media companies to develop video solutions uh, uh, for videos to be sent out to billions of users every day. They have actually developed the first uh, commercial um, uh, uh, streaming player and they also developed many other like technologies for video streaming. And then a totally different project, but also very nice, is uh, Schiele XR by the Austrian award-winning um, uh, film producer Gerda Leopold. 
Uh, this is an immersive experience where the user has the opportunity to meet the Austrian painter Egon Schiele just before he dies when he is already infected with the Spanish flu and has the chance to talk to him and at the end of the experience he even makes a painting of the person trying out this experience. And the actual idea is to extend this project and to also put a focus on other um, uh, uh, historical persons, personalities, to dive deep into their lives and their, uh, their stories. Then, uh, sorry, let's move on to the field of music. Uh, internationally, uh, the, the, uh, the, the image of Austria is very strongly, uh, um, like, uh, the focus is very strongly uh, on the music history of Austria. Uh, they have a rich music history, they have brought, brought forward many important composers, such as Mozart and Mahler, but also Schubert and Strauss. And today they are still considered to be the, the international classical music capital. Uh, they have a lot of uh, opera houses, music venues, and also festival and events. The main event is a, a concert that takes place every year on the 1st of January, and that is broadcast in 140 countries, which is the New Year's concert. And also in the field of music, uh, Austria mixes tradition with uh, new uh, innovative tools. And one example is Synchron Stage. Uh, this is um, a, a scoring uh, location and also a, a music studio where music for uh, film productions is being uh, uh, composed but also played and, and recorded and it is used by many uh, Hollywood productions and also Netflix productions, and it's uh, getting bigger and bigger, and it's very interesting. I had the interesting. I had the chance to visit it one time, and it was really amazing how on the one side you feel like tradition, but at the same time with the newest and latest technologies. Then uh, I would like to tell you a bit about Fritello, which is a startup that uh, puts a focus on how to play the guitar. It's an AI-driven um, uh, app, and it is featured by Apple a lot, so they, um, they closely collaborate with Apple, and they also have contract with all the, the big uh, um, music houses, such as Sony, Warner Music, and Universal. And then there is Music Traveler, which is a globally centralized app, uh, which was founded by, um, by uh, high-level classical musicians in Vienna, because they had the challenge to find practicing spaces while being away, but also at home, where they can play loud music and where they can put their, uh, their music instruments. So uh, by now they have uh, positioned themselves as the Air Airbnb of musicians and you can easily rent a practicing spaces for the hour or even for days if you want to. And they also have a strong network of ambassadors and investors that support them, such as Billy Joel and Quincy Jones and uh, Adrian Brody. So there is a lot going on in, in Austria. Uh, but there are also many discussions about technology versus uh, creativity. There are many experts that say that technology is going to take over human uh, creativity. Um, but my, my personal opinion is that uh, technology is here to stay and it is advancing, advancing all the time. So there is a lot of development going on. And uh, I think there is no way out of it. You should try to make use of the opportunities and chances because there are many of them, as you have seen before. And uh, this is exactly what we also try to do because in my daily job, I, I work for the Austrian Export Agency and uh, my main mission is to export, uh, to support Austrian companies from the creative industries uh, when exporting their products and services. 
And uh, to do this, we do a lot of events such as matchmakings and uh, investor pitches, exhibitions for these companies. One uh, very prominent example are the Austria showcases, as we call them, at the South by Southwest, which is a big festival in Austin. Uh, we have been organizing events there in, uh, since 2015. And another special highlight is a project coming up in December. Uh, where we will invite international artists, filmmakers, designers, uh, fashion labels to come to Austria to spend a week in the context of a residency program and to work together with Austrian companies from the same fields, but also a crossover and also with technology companies. So I'm really looking forward to that. I hope nothing comes in between. And uh, yeah, we are always very interested in collaborating with uh, international organizations and like-minded people, like-minded companies. So if anything of this uh, was relevant to you and you could imagine collaborating with us, uh, please feel free to contact me at any time. These are my contact details and we also have an office in Kiev. My colleagues Gabi and, and Irina are there as well. And we would really like to in intensify our collaboration with uh, Ukraine and with the region. So uh, please feel free to contact us at any time. Thank you very much. Ariana, спасибо большое. Thank you so much. Uh, it was indeed uh, very exciting because digital reality is approaching faster than we can run away from it. So, I will begin our first coming panel with a question. Our subject is design at New Green Normal and work with designers in these new conditions. My question is, do we have anyone in this audience who produces any product? Okay, we see several people. Do we have anyone who works with some materials or who develops materials? Who produces services? Okay, we have some. Anyone who develops business models? Great. So, are those who rose your hands, you will surely be interested in this panel uh, because we have entered a new era when uh, the parameters of business assessment have changed. We all know Green Deal, we all know about the set of principles for ecological business management, and right now those assessment principles will start impacting the economy of businesses, they will start impacting the kinds of products we got used to consume. So before I give the floor to our first uh, speaker from London, this will be a highly esteemed speaker. And by the way, uh, the speaker is going to speak English, so once again, uh, those of you who need interpretations, you still have a minute to mm, get a headset. So in this design panel, uh, we would like to make a connection between uh, the two things, uh, the new criteria of business assessment in terms of Green Deal and uh, the products and services we uh, produce and consume. So the change of uh, the world in the direction of a more ecologically conscious production is uh, inevitable. It, it's not about a bunch of some crazy ecologists who want everyone to plant trees and forbid us to use plastic bags. No, uh, there are some limits uh, which uh, we have uh, approached already. Uh, there was some uh, research underway for decades and right now the situation is pretty much catastrophic because if we, uh, the designers who are in essence constructors and businesses, if we do not start working with a new types of products, all the worst predictions will come true. 
but there is a quote survival is not a necessity we can keep on doing what we are doing or otherwise we can survive so is Darius with us already yes yes so let me introduce you our first speaker in this panel and I'm happy that he's joining us so it is Darius Prasik who has worked for uh, the uh, European Bank of uh, Reconstruction and Development is the person who made a huge contribution into Green Deal, uh, the considerable and wonderful change that has happened already. Apart from other things, Darius Prasik is developing a strategies for circular development for Georgia and uh, defines uh, this country at the international arena as uh, the country that has introduced circular economy. He is a consultant for businesses, major corporations, and it is quite natural that uh, his uh, support in the field of financing is necessary because uh, all the leading banks are using the criteria of ecological assessment of any business before uh, they finance anything. So uh, I believe uh, uh, Darius will be open for consultations and the floor goes to Darius. I'll continue in, in English if you don't mind. I have been tasked today to tell you a few uh, words about uh, circular economy as part of the Green Deal. Uh, let me start with one thing. The future is circular. This is not a choice. It's something which we will all need to, to embrace. Why is that? First of all, uh, let me just summarize the few uh, mega trends. Uh, we are uh, experiencing rapid uh, urbanization. We are living in cities, mega cities. Uh, there will be more people living in cities uh, in, in few years time and by the end of the century, nearly everyone. Uh, there is uh, changes in the demography. Uh, we are living longer. There are more of us. Uh, living longer, we expect also uh, to have purchasing power for longer. We expect goods and services. We are also a global village. Uh, we have powerful internet, we have uh, powerful phones, computers, and we uh, know about everything very quickly. So this is like a global village. And there is accelerated innovation, which we heard from the previous speaker, uh, bridging art and uh, new developments. All this uh, puts a lot of pressure on uh, resources. And some of these resources particularly those which are used in modern technologies like antimonium, um, like iridium, like um, um, titanium, copper, they are being exhausted very, very quickly. What does that mean? Uh, this means that we may face shortages of these resources in uh, the future. By the way, I will go through the slides very quickly. I uh, will leave them with you as aid memoir uh, however, I wanted to leave you with a few um, uh, key thoughts about uh, circular economy. But circular economy is the future, as I said. Currently, it's a linear economy. What does it mean? It's economy where we take resources, virgin resources, we make things, we use things, and what do we do? We dispose them off, losing completely the, the value which is embedded. So what are the risks of uh, behaving like this? First of all, market risks. If resources become scarce, then uh, the price may be very volatile. Um, there may be trade bans. There may be higher, higher interest rates. There may be lower investor interest. Operationally, we may have disrupted production because certain resources uh, will um, not be available. So uh, to address this shortage of resources, we have to think about a um, new way, uh, which is um, circularity. So we are moving 
to uh, economy where we design, as this is a session on design, we design things that there is no waste at the end. We design them out. We keep products and materials in use as long as we can. And we also, if we cannot keep them, we regenerate them, we reuse them, and we also regenerate natural systems. So in the circular economy, just to give you an overview, we have different business models. I'll mention them a little bit later. Many of them are service-based. Rather than actually producing something, selling something, cashing money, we are producing, we are offering services. Uh, just to give you, you know, a, an example, how many of you can tell me an average car in Europe, how much time it is actually parked in a garage or in the street? If you don't know the answer, I'll tell you. 93%, only 7% the car is actually used. Is it the useful use of the car? I will leave the answer with you. Then in circular economy, we design with new specification, trying to uh, prolong life of the products. We are designing for reuse. When we cannot use the, pro uh, the product, we can reuse components of the product. So this is designing for the material recovery. And we are trying to avoid using virgin resources. We are trying to put emphasis on uh, recycled resources. What are the, the key challenges? Of course, we are still living in linear economy. And to move circular is a fundamental change. It's a shift systemic change. Uh, uh, systemic change changes cash flow, changes the risk. Uh, so it is more difficult sometimes to raise financing for circular projects. But many groups are currently working and accelerating this work. So what are the key drivers? Uh, I already mentioned resource constraints, but what we had already in the previous session, there is a rapid technological development, and there is also um, pressure from the consumers, also uh, urbanization, which I already mentioned, that we are living, more of us are living in actually not in rural, but in urban areas. Key opportunities is actually when we um, recycle, when we reuse resources, recover them. Uh, this is actually the risking of a future commodity supply. Uh, we, are, we may reduce our manufacturing costs. Uh, we can also uh, come up with new revenue streams. For example, if we develop reverse logistic. Reverse logistic is like taking things from consumers for rep repairing, for regeneration. There is a need for a completely different type of um, the service like reverse uh, logistics. So there are many opportunities. Uh, this diagram which I'm putting on the screen now is uh, something which is classical for a circular economy. It's Mel Ellen MacArthur Foundation. On the right-hand side, you've got technical cycle. On the left-hand side is biological cycle. We are trying in our technical cycles to mirror what is happening in nature. So we maintain things, we reuse we refurbish them, recycle, uh, and the same is on the left-hand side with the natural resources. Uh, the models which are um, used in circular economy uh, are so-called disrupt models. Disrupt, uh, it, it comes from the first letters um, of designing for the future, incorporating digital technology, keeping, sustaining, preserving what we already have, thinking out of the box about uh, new business models, using waste as a resource, uh, prioritizing regenerative resources. And what is also important in circular economy, we've got a lot of collaboration, working together. It's less of a competition supply chain and the main producers are becoming a certain entity which works together. So uh, to, to sum up, in the linear economy on the left hand side, after using the product, we lose completely value. And what we are trying to do, we are trying to keep the value, this is the, the value preservation in the circular economy. 
Now, uh, you already heard from, from many sources about European Green Deal, uh, which is like the future of, of Europe, uh, trying uh, addressing practically all uh, sections of the economy. And a circular economy has been uh, listed as one of the key pillars of the Green Deal. Um, this is something uh, which has been um, developed by the European Commission in 95, a renewed last year, when the um, European Commission came up uh, with so-called Circular Economy Action Plan, uh, which actually targets um, the life cycle of products and um, making uh, sustainable products the norm in the European Union, uh, give more information to consumers so they actually choose uh, consciously uh, what they are purchasing and there are also focus on uh, those sectors which uh, will reduce waste and which are sort of low-hanging fruits where the circularity potential is the highest those are electronics batteries packaging plastics textiles uh, about plastic you actually have heard recently that there is even um, uh, now global action um, trying to to come up with a sustainable management of plastics uh, as a contribution to global issues when we are talking to globally about global issues circular economy has a potential to address at least 12 of the um, sustainable development goals out of, out of 17 uh, development uh, goals, uh, which uh, could contribute to countries' commitments under this. Now, uh, let me say a few words about the circular economy models. Um, uh, we are talking uh, basically about uh, three types of models. Uh, circular design, this is designing products and materials with the aim for long value retention. So at the stage of design, and remember, this is the driver. Uh, you may hear sometimes that it, it is like recycling, reusing. No, it's first of all designing things that you can reuse, that you can keep longer. Then optimal use models. These are um, uh, mostly models based on services. Uh, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, if you want to have clothes clean, do you want to be an owner of a washing machine or have the clothes clean? If the answer is, I want to have my clothes to be clean, then you can probably lease washing machine, which will be installed by the producer, who will ensure that it will last longer, it will repair it, and you will pay just a monthly fee instead of buying an expensive uh, washing machine. And there are also value recovery uh, models where actually after the useful time of a product, you remanufacture, reuse uh, components. Um, some people um, um, list also circular support models. These are mostly um, models which are supporting the three of those which I have uh, mentioned. So what is the role of business? As, as we've seen, we have many re business representatives. Um, businesses need uh, to, to think uh, carefully about the future. Uh, the legislation is coming. Uh, Ukraine is an associated country, so we'll also have to come up with legislation like extended producers' responsibility, for example. Um, uh, you have to think, you, producers or businesses have to think about potential initial investments, uh, modification of processes, um, thinking whether they are optimizing the use of resources, possibly retraining the staff. Uh, so, all these things, what could they bring? Uh, there are a lot of business opportunities. Uh, first of all, um, it's a question of um, uh, effective management. When you start thinking about this, it's, it's the management is the driver for the change. Then um, making the most of the res resources which are available, strengthening your collaboration with your supply chain. Uh, and building trust and confidence, uh, being transparent uh, with your uh, collaborators. So what are the guiding principles for the organizations? By the way, some countries already introduce norms, uh, standards, uh, which um, allow companies to go uh, circular. First of all, think about the change that it is a systemic change. You have to holistically approach. It cannot be just restricted to one or two departments. Innovation is the driver. We heard already in the first presentation. Innovation will really drive the change. Uh, 
Uh, making sure that you collaborate uh, with your uh, partners, with your supply chain, you optimize the value and be uh, open and transparent what you are doing. Uh, key areas for change is um, design of organizational structure. And you know, here the um, uh, experience says that actually uh, those who empower uh, individuals at all levels of organization are the most successful. There has to be strong and open-minded leadership, uh, communication both internally and externally. Uh, don't underestimate internal communication. You have to first uh, uh, convince your board, uh, your workers, and then you start communicating externally, but you also have to expect unexpected, so things may not always go to plan as most of uh, uh, us already know it very well. Uh, I wanted to, to mention, as uh, Elena in, in the introduction mentioned uh, the financial potential, uh, that uh, it is being assessed that uh, the circular economy, it, it's a multi-trillion uh, euro um, area. If, for example, um, uh, we introduce circularity in mobility, built environment and food in Europe, this is annually about 2 trillion euro uh, uh, could be gained. Moreover, uh, listen, in the past uh, two years, a year and a half, uh, ESG, environmental social governance issues, including circularity, are not anymore a luxury. These are elements which are being discussed by board, by the decision makers who take strategic decisions. So, in my uh, brief introduction, I want to conclude that circular economy is the future. It can address and mitigate many effects of the current linear way, how we approach. Uh, the transition requires systemic change. Uh, it requires rethinking how we use resources, both human resources and material resources. Uh, it is also education for uh, the potential consumers and informing them about um, uh, how the pro products were produced, what are the features, how long they can uh, use the product. Uh, listen, regulation is also coming. Uh, I mentioned associated country will have to enact regulation, which, for example, extended producers' responsibility will require producers to take responsibility for their product. Those who will be first will be actually taking advantage of being first and they will benefit from being first and actually having things already implemented by the time it is required. And remember, we are in the design session. The design is an enabler. This is something which is driving the circularity of the future. Thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any questions, you can approach me later or during the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Darius. It was a very insightful presentation. If anyone needs to get the slide, please contact me and we will share this secret information. Darius, please stay with us and we will invite our uh, next speaker in the meantime. And small remark from me, the things that Darius has mentioned are the inconvenient truths for us and for business because we will have to change our habits, our consumer and, uh, management and production habits. We don't need the chairs yet. Okay, so right now I'm going to give the floor to our next speaker, Tatiana Solovey. Tatiana, please. A few words about Tatiana. A round of applause for Darius and for Tatiana. Tatiana is uh, editor in chief of uh, Bureau, but many of you uh, know her as observer of Vogue Ukraine and probably the first person who started to speak of uh, sustainability in the field of fashion, started to speak of uh, the existence of this problem. And in 2016, with a group of activists, Tatiana initiated a movement for ethical fashion, fashion revolution. 
a round of applause for Tatiana, and Tatiana, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a very uh, uh, encouraging presentation of me as a personality. Okay, so f a few words about sustainable development and how it was introduced in the field of fashion and how uh, this is reflecting the change that is happening in the global consciousness. Uh, uh, the industry of fashion reflects what is happening uh, in the field of uh, consciousness of the consumers and it's not only about some uh, beautiful bags and clothes, it's about uh, also business needs uh, and business's ability to earn on fast changes. So taking those two contrary things into account uh, show us uh, a lot of insights that are happening in the world of fashion. So uh, this word itself, uh, sustainability, was uh, first heard uh, many years ago, back in 1982. It was done by uh, Gru Harlem and uh, she described uh, three main areas uh, in which uh, this had to happen. So this seemed so far away from fashion, but uh, there was a turning point. And after the turning point, there was some understanding uh, that fashion also has to take on this responsibility that was a huge catastrophe in Bangladesh. And uh, it happened in 2013 in Rana Plaza. And this was a huge tragedy that drew attention of mass media and uh, the entire world to the problem of ethics uh, uh, in the field of fashion, that it needs to be articulated. So uh, the so-called fast, fast fashion was uh, the first to be impacted because these uh, third world companies are involved in the production of the huge amounts of those clothes. So this discourse of 2013 was uh, mainly uh, the field of for journalists and the uh, so-called fashion punks who were sharing the world uh, word on how the clothes are made and who are the people behind those five euro t-shirts. Uh, this was a kind of communication that was scorned at uh, in the world of uh, glamorous magazines and it was considered that uh, those issues will not gain attention in the field. But uh, another turning point was 2019, when uh, there was a huge uh, line of trendsetting magazines, uh, trendsetting in the field of design, fashion, lifestyle. Uh, it was co Nast, and uh, they have launched a series of uh, materials of modern day uh, slavery, of uh, the huge CO2 emissions, etc. So uh, this was also the time of uh, radicalization of uh, reporters language and for instance uh, The Guardian was the first to introduce uh, the section on sustainable development and they started writing about this even before uh, the glamorous uh, magazines uh, started to write about this. They supported uh, s the strongest language about these issues like uh, they, they spoke about climatic catastrophe and it became understandable that uh, the aesthetic industries also have to change. Uh, they have to gain this new expertise they didn't have before. And if 10 years ago, if uh, I was a fashion journalist, 
uh, I only needed to understand if uh, the idea was truly innovational or it, if it was uh, plagiarism. Right now I also have to be a chemist and an ecologist. I, I have to understand uh, the aspects of ethics and ecology of manufacturing. And uh, I have to be able to write about a sustainable fashion without uh, serious mistakes or disinformation. And it's a shame to admit, but uh, while uh, the green future uh, was recognized in the f uh, fashion industry, uh, a huge confusion has happened. Uh, it was believed that fashion was uh, the second industry to pollute our planet, but actually it was not true. It was uh, the consequence of uh, the enormous energy of uh, people in this uh, industry who were so adamant in changing this discourse. And so this uh, phrase uh, they used was taken out of the context. It actually uh, came from uh, one research of uh, textile industry and it was true only for a certain region of China which uh, indeed is massively involved I in a textile industry but for some rhetoric reason this phrase was taken out of the context and was used for two years by many people, including me, unfortunately. So I regret that and this shows how much industry was opposed to these topics and how fast it had to change. So in this industry we could see the change that is happening generally in the public consciousness. Uh, the, public, uh, the, the subject of sustainable development um, quite often was taken to the extreme. As Vanessa Friedman once uh, joked, once uh, the designer makes some uh, sustainable uh, collection, there are only two motives in the communication. Uh, one of them is green future, another is uh, uh, the doomsday. So, uh, as we could see before COVID from uh, Balenciaga, uh, who uh, communicated those apocalyptical pictures of e uh, ecological destruction, and on the other and we have those wonderful bucolic pictures of uh, us spending our times uh, among the green nature. At the same time, uh, there were some wonderful uh, initiatives uh, advertised in this terrible way. I think thanks to fashion, those extremes uh, are not acceptable anymore. People are tired from uh, those two versions uh, of uh, ecological language. And we need to recognize that over this short uh, time, from the uh, complete disregard to complete embracing and acceptance, we have approached at uh, a situation when sustainability became a part of a reputation picture of anything that's associated with uh, fashion. And it's not only about fashion designers, it's uh, also, uh, for instance, involves such examples as uh, Simon Johnson. And it's a, a girl who has built a powerful uh, reputation on being uh, a participant of every ecological movement possible. She protects the seals, she uh, rents uh, all the uh, clothes for her important events, such as her marriage. Uh, she has uh, uh, rented all, all her dresses for Summit G7. And uh, this her involvement in this right agenda. This is what enables her to be not only the first lady uh, who accompanies the British Prime Minister, but also uh, a woman who communicates a lot and who has a powerful position in, in the politics. A few words about 
a quick response of uh, fashion, a quick response to uh, the change. Uh, quite often it looks like greenwashing. And uh, as a specialist remark, at, at the G7 summit, where 32 organizations have signed the uh, Green Deal, uh, it entailed uh, the carbon neutral collections from many brands and uh, this entailed lots of uh, criticism because basically it means uh, that uh, those organizations used uh, the carbon quotas. They paid someone money for uh, the coverage of uh, the carbon footprint of their associations. So quite often it is greenwashing and all of us are facing this. Here's a wonderful case of how the ecological agenda contributes to relaunching certain uh, areas in business. So, for instance, uh, the diamonds that were grown in the laboratory for quite some time were seen as uh, synthetic, as not real, and it was considered that they are not a real competition for uh, the real diamonds from uh, the ground. But Actually, once uh, this uh, green startup was launched, the startup using green energy uh, with uh, uh, the best of the green uh, consumptions and Carla Otto assisting uh, them with the PR, it was a relaunch of the entire uh, industry and it brought back uh, the mm, status of uh, diamonds to those artificial uh, diamonds it was uh, it entailed the change of the language uh, this uh, uh, diamonds have been called the lab grown diamonds and previously uh, if if they were not uh, considered as a competition for the real diamonds now they suddenly are these methods help to relaunch business and they show how major corporations uh, stop competing with each other in this regard. So, for instance, uh, Karen Company, which is uh, uh, the owner of 16 major uh, brands of decorations, uh, they presented uh, the environmental profit and loss uh, assessment and it's uh, Marie Claire Davo who was uh, advisor of uh, the Minister of Ecology under Nicolas Sarkozy government. She has managed to introduce uh, a lot of changes in the uh, ecological agenda of her country, but uh, later she switched to uh, the private business. And so uh, the company openly publishes this material, everyone can use it. And on top of that transparency, uh, they are very careful about uh, the language they use, especially the language they use about people who use uh, the products that are not uh, that sustainable. So when they describe uh, uh, the industry in uh, Vietnam and Italy, they always take into account such things as uh, the employment, the impact on the local economy, uh, on the environment. Uh, this system is far from uh, looking for heroes and villains, but it looks at uh, the production of uh, the complexity of uh, factors and uh, this is an exciting story and it influences uh, big business even the business uh, that uh, is not working in the field of luxury here you can see uh, the advertising campaign uh, here you can see uh, the blouse uh, that was made from uh, viscose uh, uh, that uh, that was made out of the waste uh, of uh, citrus production. So uh, there is a startup uh, that uh, was uh, implemented through uh, a fund uh, financed by H&M and it looks for new solutions for relaunching the industry and 
In 2015, they founded this. Uh, uh, they funded this startup once it was created, and also they supported some production facilities. And uh, now it, it has been possible to create some mass market closes. Again, at some limited scale for now, but uh, in such a way that it meets some of the ecological requirements of sustainable fashion and uh, they were first to tell that uh, sustainability it's not only about uh, some uh, luxury of course it's it requires additional spending of uh, time additional spending of effort but their mission is to make eco fashion uh, sustainable uh, so that uh, the a consumer uh, doesn't have to think twice uh, so that they can find ecological products at any shelf of any store. Uh, this entails a, a combination of sciences and different industries on the market. They are looking for solutions which are uh, not only about the external look of uh, the uh, product. So it was Nira Duma who organized Fashion Tech Lab. Uh, unfortunately, she made some unethical uh, statements some time ago, so she's not that much ex uh, respected anymore. But at a certain point, she collected uh, enough money to uh, found this venture fund and to be able to uh, fund the search of new industries, new technical innovations in the field of fashion. And finally, finally, here is an interesting trend about sustainable solutions in Ukraine. We are one of the countries which is ranking first or a second in terms of uh, second hand um, clothes that is being brought here. So our main task is to learn uh, to uh, mm, recycle uh, those products uh, that are sold everywhere around Ukraine. So three of the most uh, popular brands here, uh, they are related to uh, uh, exactly this. Xenia Schneider, Jeans, Better Us, uh, that's the fashion director of Ukrainian Vogue, who again finds some uh, second-hand uh, uh, products on the market and uh, changes them. And then Yasa Hamen cut t-shirts uh, and uh, shirts. They do some upcycling. They add some artistic elements to those used clothes. So again, there are interesting paradigms here and Ukraine can become a country which finds some unique solution on how to make with, uh, how to work with huge amounts of second hand and to turn it from waste to treasure. So sustainability is here to stay. The only way to proceed is to embrace it and to understand that it needs to become one of our human values. Uh, the concept of a better world uh, can uh, not uh, be um, uh, taken away from us and we all are humans and at some point big businesses and important people made uh, mistakes uh, in uh, the public field, but at the same time some solutions are being found and maybe in 10 years uh, we will find ourselves in a new and better world. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, I see that we uh, have got more people in the audience. I could be listening to Tatiana forever. She indeed can inspire and I have a dream. As uh, the organizer of this panel, I dream that one day Ukraine becomes a provider of uh, solutions in terms of materials 
for the entire world. I believe in the potential of our designers, I believe in our young creative guys, and I would like to invite Yulia Bilecka, the person who is a co-founder of an ecological startup as lab. You could all see uh, their works here. Uh, they use bioplastics and Yulia will tell more of that. Thank you. Another round of applause. People worked so hard. We were here yesterday since 7 p.m. Hello. I'm Yulia Bilecka, I'm the co-founder of S-Lab, where we grow packaging, construction materials, decoration materials from uh, the technical cannabis and uh, mushrooms. You could see some of our products here near the entrance. So where did we get uh, this idea of uh, using cannabis and mushrooms? Uh, we started from those numbers. People are using 5 million tons of plastic per year. This is a terrible number, but I don't want to scare anyone. I want to show you the problem and there is an opportunity behind every problem. So there is a full truck of plastics that goes to the ocean each minute while we are speaking here. And these photos is something that I saw with naked eye. Uh, this is something that I saw at the paradise island of Bali. Uh, there were rocks of uh, uh, waste and this is not something that, uh, something that they have thrown away. Uh, this is uh, the trash that is coming from the ocean and uh, they even have a special term, a, a season of garbage from the ocean. I was not connected with uh, uh, the environmental movement or uh, the cannabis or anything else, but I realized that it's high in time to rethink the materials we are using. We started to experiment with cannabis and mushrooms and I know it may sound weird, but our purpose was to create uh, biodegradable mushrooms. We started to use uh, technical cannabis. We learned that it's a very uh, strong uh, component that brings uh, strength and structure to our material. And also we need to say have a binding component as well. So. As for the binding component, we also decided not to use artificial glue, but to use some natural material. And what was available in nature? Well, we started to experience with uh, uh, mushrooms. We, we got uh, this uh, biocomposite material, which can be used to uh, substitute packaging, construction materials, uh, decorations. We can even grow some ecological uh, uh, skin. So uh, we have two components. We uh, have uh, this technical cannabis. We uh, have the mushroom material. Uh, we are only use uh, the waste material from uh, the uh, technical cannabis production. We actually take in the waste from the field. We take them uh, to our uh, uh, laboratory and we put uh, the mix in the form where it's been grown for uh, five to six years. Uh, the mix changes to uh, get the form of uh, uh, the uh, uh, form we uh, put it in and basically we grow other things uh, that we uh, uh, sell. So it is 100% biodegradable material thanks to uh, the two components it's made of and the components are fully organic. 
after using those materials, you can uh, put uh, the product uh, uh, in uh, the soil, and it it will only take 30 days for for it to uh, degrade. Uh, quite often, we are asked if this material is hydrophobic. The answer is yes. You can pour water in it, and also it has some uh, heat insulation and sound insulation materials. Uh, uh, and these properties uh, let you use it in the construction. Some examples of how these materials are used. Uh, so I will show you closer. This is packaging for some jewelry. Uh, we have got used to the wonderful, uh, beautiful red boxes, but some of the Ukrainian manufacturers are not afraid to use this kind of packaging. Uh, this is a thermo box. Uh, this is something you can use for transportation of medicines. Uh, this is a box for wine bottles. Uh, these are uh, the filling materials for uh, to be used in the boxes with different products. Here is a packaging for uh, essential oils of uh, Ukrainian manufacturer. Also, we work in the field of uh, design and decorations. We uh, create uh, all the weirdest things such as uh, uh, vases, uh, spoons, uh, chandeliers, etc. And uh, also we uh, produce uh, heat and uh, sound insulation panels. And the main focus we have right now is packaging, because 40% of everything, uh, ev every bit of plastic that is manufactured is packaging. If we substitute just some part of that plastic, we will see a huge uh, positive impact uh, on uh, on environment. So a few words about uh, uh, technical cannabis. Uh, first of all, uh, the fibers are very strong in comparison with other natural materials. So this material is very strong. It takes very short time for this plant to grow. It's uh, universal. You can create uh, 25,000 uh, uh, types of material from it. Also, uh, this plant is used uh, for bioremediation of plants. So if some land was polluted by growing of uh, other agricultural plants, uh, this uh, plant is a way to restore the soil. And also, uh, it is known that uh, 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 technical cannabis is used for the production of bioplastics and fuel. For instance, they were used uh, in uh, the manufacturing of BMW i3, which has been available on the market for quite some time. And so, uh, for instance, on the door of this car you can see uh, some of that uh, technical fiber. It's a designer solution that shows uh, how much they strive for uh, being environment friendly. And here are some Ukrainian examples. Deva Home uh, produces clothes and uh, footwear and Hempire hem uses uh, uh, technical hemp to build uh, to build houses. Uh, now a few words about fungal mycelium. Mycelium is something that we usually don't see with our naked eyes when we are looking at a mushroom. We only see the top part of uh, uh, the mushroom, the body of it. But uh, mycelium is something that is under uh, under the ground, so to speak. So if we compare a mushroom with a tree, it's a uh, root, so to speak. So uh, these are these white fibers, uh, GIFs, uh, which consist of the natural construction material of hitazan and hitin. And once mycelium starts uh, growing on that technical hemp, it sort of uh, fills in all the space. It uh, 
works as a glue uh, put in the hemp together and uh, this is how uh, our product can be used for many many years thanks to those features here is an example of a building that you can see in the modern art museum in new york uh, the bricks were made uh, out of mycelium they used uh, corn instead of hemp in this case and uh, this is uh, this is what they used to build this house here is example from the netherlands they used mycelium to create a place for an exhibition hall and it was used for an actual exhibition of some products and all those white walls they were made out of mycelium and also in New York uh, all of this uh, ceiling with beautiful lamps it, it has been made out of mycelium there are many examples uh, of uh, the use of mycelium in uh, uh, the construction here you can see some other ways to uh, uh, use it in different uh, sponges, patches, face masks, etc. Uh, everything for the beauty industry and also uh, there, there is um, there are some attempts to grow leather and we, we see major companies uh, promising to make new collections out of uh, this leather for instance uh, Hermes is promising to uh, produce a line of uh, handbags out of this material next year and also uh, there is meat uh, made out of mycelium here are some other examples of uh, the use of uh, this artificial leather people make uh, watches, footwear, uh, clothes and uh, you can see that uh, it's practically the same skin as the one we contain from animals thank you, thank you for your attention Yulia, could you please stay with us for a minute uh, Yogan is very modest, he is uh, standing behind by I would like to announce that next week this team together with Yova Yager will be presenting their work in Paris at the Design Week it seems it's a wonderful example of what can be done and knowing what these guys started from they indeed were not designers they, they were uh, not uh, developers of anything they, they were economic manager kind of people but they managed to develop something like this and right now I would like to give the floor to uh, the person who can be rightly called actually these are two people Tatiana and Olga I call them goddesses of design I truly believe that these are people who spent years trying to shed the light of what design is and to bring this information to our region around the globe design means uh, everything that is developed to change thinking behavior and life of people for the better this is what design means designer is a researcher a developer someone who offers us something new and we as a business can either accept or discard it and so these new solutions for our green future uh, they are somewhere between design and business needs so I would like to give the floor to Tatiana Stachowska co-founder of the educational and consulting platform Creoscope who had its conferences uh, in uh, Unit City on many occasions thank you, thank you Elena uh, it's uh, quite a generous presentation of our team I'm actually not a designer my first education is in the field of physics but yeah, I had some passion for design and uh, thanks to that we have been 
more than 10 years in this field of uh, educational events uh, such as lectures, trade shows, uh, seminars, etc. We have lots of people from the creative industry, we have business people, marketologists, and we have been over 10 years in this field providing this uh, programs in order to help people delve in the world of beauty and the world of solutions. Uh, today our subject is quite multifaceted, the definition of sustainability is quite broad and uh, different for each field, but generally we as uh, inhabitants of the planet Earth want to live in the clean environment, uh, swim in clean rivers, uh, breathe with clean air, eat clean food, uh, we want animals and our children to be happy. But if we look at uh, uh, the amounts of waste uh, uh, that is produced in our country, uh, the amount of products of the approach that uh, we have been using for decades. Uh, this was a human-based uh, approach, human-based design, and we are approaching this uh, turning point, and right now the paradigm is shifting for uh, the planet-centric approach. What is good for the planet is good for me not vice versa. And right now there is a huge challenge before the designers, before manufacturers, because a huge amount of waste is being created among others because of designers and manufacturers. And it's their responsibility. They are responsible for the huge amounts of products we can see. And we understand that uh, it's it's not bought yet, but it's already waste, and we already heard about this from one of the previous speakers. It's linear manufacturers, so of course uh, there should be some vision from the very beginning, some understanding of how this product is going to be used uh, in the future. There is a life cycle, just like we can see in nature life cycle of a plant, it, it lives for some time, then it becomes food for other plants beside it. And uh, there is some storytelling, some communication behind that, communication with the consumer. And this way the consumer is getting knowledge about uh, what kind of product they are buying and uh, how this project, uh, uh, product was made, etc. Here is an interesting case. When I first saw it, I was impressed by the approach itself. There is a big amount of waste, and we have heard of that uh, on, on many occasions. It is being uh, produced uh, when um, uh, some exhibitions are held, and uh, this concept was developed by a Danish bureau at an exhibition and uh, the idea was uh, that all uh, the elements that are uh, used for the creation of this pavilion, uh, these are uh, rented elements and they are given back in uh, the same condition as they were before. So no glue was used, uh, no bolts, no nails, and also there was a social component in, in this. Uh, the inhabitants of the city were involved in uh, collecting uh, plastics. Uh, the plastics was used to uh, make panels out of uh, recycled material, and after the exhibition the inhabitants could take those panels home. So it's an example of uh, how uh, certain elements are taken for temporary use. Here is an example of uh, Studio Mixtura. It's also Netherlands and Hoven. And um, uh, the CEO uh, is uh, Daria, uh, who serves a good example of uh, who a modern designer should be. 
Uh, she is professionally educated as a chemist. Uh, she is uh, also a wonderful speaker, organizer of exhibitions, and um, she helps organizations to uh, reshape uh, their approach to work with waste, to reshape the life cycle of products. So everything that she uh, develops it involves work with uh, the companies and modern designers, especially in uh, Western European countries, uh, they uh, introduce uh, this element from the stage of uh, education. So this approach of sustainable development and circular uh, economy, that's a part of education of designers in universities. And here is a niche example of how uh, used uh, uh, products, some used China, which uh, of course not many people would like to buy. There is uh, a company in Netherlands, uh, Urban Nature Culture, which uh, has crea created this collection where uh, they uh, used as uh, this luster made from a combination of waste materials, waste uh, of glass, paper, other material as well. So in essence, this was waste, but it's a waste that can be further used. Thus, they are given the second life to uh, those cups, uh, the china, and uh, uh, they are introducing some new colors. Uh, they are making uh, interesting sets, combining different colors, and it also has a certain social uh, aspect, social component, and it enables some communication with uh, the consumer. Sometimes the consumer would recall that uh, this is uh, the kind of cup they uh, had in the grandmother's set, then they come back and to buy some uh, additional objects. So uh, uh, this uh, collection, uh, these sets are available in many uh, countries of Europe. And here is an example of how it can uh, look. This uh, luster can look differently because the components can be uh, different, the waste components. And also it, it can be used for uh, ceramic products for uh, different use, for internal and external use for uh, the facades of the building, because it is shown in many researches when some ceramic tails are used uh, at the fronts of the buildings, it uh, helps to elongate uh, the uh, lifetime of uh, those buildings and at the week of uh, uh, the uh, Netherlands design in October uh, there will be a new concept presented, the concept of uh, bricks made of recycled waste. Here is one more exciting project, uh, Gundega Strauberga is uh, the author of this product, so she is uh, from Latvia, but she also studied at Eindhoven, Netherlands. So that's a new concept, and uh, we, we could hear from the previous speaker that it's often the initiative of the designer uh, themselves. So in this case, in the same way, she was worried by the fact that in the Baltic Sea, uh, there is a big number of uh, fishing nets and uh, many of uh, uh, the inhabitants of the seas uh, suffer uh, from this. So she asked herself what she could do out of those nets because uh, some uh, companies, some organizations are already involved in catching uh, those nets and taking them out of uh, the sea. So he, she developed uh, the system of what needs to be done uh, with those nets, how they are dried and uh, how they are uh, later made into this uh, 
products is baskets, uh, which mm, she uh, basically saw and was inspired by something she saw at uh, the old uh, consumer markets. And uh, this is something that is uh, being made uh, using the labor of uh, the local uh, population, those uh, living at the uh, seashore. So it's a multifaceted project. It also creates opportunities for people to earn money, but also it's a, a good product that can be sold to tourists. Another project that uh, uh, also s seems uh, quite uh, surprising to me uh, it's developed by uh, Billy Van Hyde, uh, a young person from the Netherlands who believes it's important to find beauty even in unexpected places. So the products that are made out of waste, uh, they don't have to be unpleasant, they have to be beautiful. And uh, this example, this bag shows what can be done out of a uh, cow's stomach and this raises the question what is garbage for us and here is uh, one more uh, proof uh, uh, a netherlands company that sells uh, expensive furniture and it's using um, uh, processed skin from uh, uh, the cow's stomach and they are using it in their furniture. So we understand that plastic uh, pollutes the environment but once it has uh, been created we cannot dispose it anywhere so uh, Good Plastic is yet another company it is from the Netherlands, but it's also present in Ukraine. And uh, they make products out of uh, used plastic, which are very beautiful and uh, which uh, find lots of cases of use, window sills, uh, uh, window panes, etc., uh, shelves. Many uh, companies are using uh, those products already in their stores. We can see some panels in the hotels. This plastic can uh, be of different sources. This can be uh, bottles, uh, some uh, household equipment, etc. Uh, yet another project uh, from Netherlands. It's a model of a house uh, that's fully made out of uh, biodegradable materials. This is an example of circular economy. And uh, uh, here is an example of uh, uh, kitchen uh, that uh, has been made out of different waste materials. And in fact, the entire house can be easily dismantled when necessary. And it's a good example of uh, how we are able to make a new product, but uh, we have uh, the understanding from the very beginning how its life cycle is going to end. And also when some details are broken, the companies need to be able to offer substitutes uh, for this product to be fixed. Here is another example of how houses can look in the future. And here I have to mention a pioneer of the industry of recycling and upcycling, Pit Hineig, who is um, also a designer from Netherlands and he takes pieces of uh, wood basically old chairs old window panes etc and he makes such expensive designer products uh, and a lot of uh, different uh, products can be made out of that and as uh, Tatiana Solovey has mentioned, it is 
quite expensive to have such things, but it's a kind of a manifesto uh, on the part of people who are buying them. And also three years ago, together with IKEA, uh, they uh, launched a uh, uh, product for mass market as well. Uh, this showed that uh, this also can be introduced for mass market. And also I would like to mention some of our Ukrainian companies which also initiate uh, some activity intended to uh, promote upcycling. So for instance, Reban company is uh, using uh, old banners to uh, turn them into beautiful accessories. Uh, s some of those banners are used at uh, uh, the exhibitions, uh, uh, trade shows. And here is another company uh, that uh, uses uh, plastic with a extrusion approach. Uh, they make a lot of objects for household use and uh, they can last for a long time. Thank you for your attention. And before I leave this stage, uh, I'd like to tell that we as uh, consumers are approaching uh, a point in time when we will have to get used to the new aesthetics. We have got used to certain products, to certain looks of certain products, but uh, the current situation uh, and uh, the future changes uh, will drive us towards the new aesthetics. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. So uh, the first thing we have to do away with is uh, the plastic bags. Uh, those who still have plastic bags, please uh, keep them as something you will be showing your grandkids. We will have to do away with many products and again it's uh, some inconvenient uh, subject to discuss. Business will have to invest a lot in order to be uh, producing uh, more eco-friendly uh, products and it uh, sounds illogical in order to uh, manufacture something environmentally friendly I have to spend money but if I don't spend this money I will have to pay it in the form of fines. So it's a serious subject and uh, uh, quite recently we had uh, a conversation at one of the events with uh, top executives of the companies and one of the people in this dialogue told us, okay, now let's speak of something pleasant. People don't want to think about those subjects. People don't want to think about uh, footwear made of uh, waste materials. But we have to change. Uh, the materials have to change. And uh, we will right now show you an example of a new product. I will uh, invite to this stage a startup which is called EFA. It's Dasha and Ilya will tell more about themselves right now. Hello, hello everyone. I hope that uh, our story is going to be more encouraging and it, it, it will show you how we as designers in the background are able to build business uh, with uh, sustainable development in our uh, basis. So we uh, make disposable uh, products such as uh, this paper toothbrush. It's a fully biodegradable toothbrush and uh, there, there is no competition for this product. I will start from the business part and Ilya will continue as a designer. We started from the problem. Once we uh, understood deeper about uh, 
the, the problem. Uh, of course, everyone uh, understood that uh, toothbrushes are something associated with cleanliness, but uh, all of those toothbrushes that you are using and that your grandmothers uh, were using, uh, they uh, are still here on the planet or uh, alternatively they are burnt. So once we uh, looked into the subject uh, of uh, disposable toothbrushes, we uh, realized uh, that just one hotel is using six tons of uh, subject, uh, six tons of plastics per year for toothbrushes. And this is where the idea came from. It was Ilya's idea and he has spent uh, some time with this idea. He told me about this idea at our first date and this is how we built our company and our family. So, uh, the idea of a toothbrush uh, was actually quite obvious. Why don't we substitute plastic with paper? Uh, initially, uh, the idea was not even about paper, but uh, about some material that is more eco-friendly. Okay, so, uh, yes, the uh, body of this um, toothbrush is made out of uh, paper, which is used, uh, uh, which is based on uh, the uh, sugar cane, so we do not use much water for uh, this toothbrush and uh, there is some nylon uh, used uh, for, uh, for the brush itself and the nylon can be used, um, can be recycled. Previously we worked on the in the B2B a segment we wanted to substitute those disposable toothbrushes in the hotels, airplanes we planned with the corporate segment and we wanted to work with uh, the segment of government procurement uh, but also there is one more uh, interesting uh, market for us the market of prisons in prisons uh, the usual toothbrushes are forbidden because they can be used as weapons our toothbrushes are much more difficult to use as weapons, so there is an opportunity to use them in prisons. So uh, here are some of the brands uh, that uh, became our customers, Netflix, Marriott, uh, Lotte, Anatara. That's not only because we were able to make a toothbrush out of paper, but that's because we managed to make it beautiful. And uh, people are amazed at what they see at our website. Uh, they always think it's a multi-billion company. Because of the beautiful design, we make an ecological product, but we also make it desirable for the market. And this is how we create uh, impact for uh, the environment. So this is a reference to uh, the thought that many people have. Uh, when a person uh, thinks of uh, something environment friendly, uh, they think it's it's for geeks. It's for th for those who are uh, veggies, who on the uh, very used clothes, etc. But uh, we, as a people of protest, we we believe uh, that uh, the design should be beautiful. It should be likable. The team consists of uh, five people, but still we are able to work with those huge brands. And actually, Netflix uh, contacted us on their own initiative. I was surprised by their message. Uh, I, I got the message at night. I uh, tried to wake Ilya, and he thought uh, that it's, it's about our subscription. But no, it was about our product. And when I asked how uh, they found us, they said uh, they noticed our prod product because it was unique, it was beautiful and it solved uh, the problem uh, they, they had. So that's thanks to five people and a wonderful product. 
So we have shared a bit on how all of this emerged. It was Ilya who created uh, the design and the awesomeness of this product is in the fact that the design of this toothbrush uh, yeah, brings the idea it is modern it it has nothing extra nothing that's not necessary for use it's called the utilitarian design it's uh, the design which is free from any extra elements as uh, the technologies we sometimes see in uh, the movies so in the future design can look very simple so uh, the simpler design is uh, the more uh, des uh, the, the more desire the more opportunity for the project will be so this is probably something that people will use in the future in the outer space so uh, consumption has a trend uh, toward uh, simplicity towards simplification of materials and it it can be awesome it can be exciting without any gold decorations yes we sometimes see in the marketing that uh, marketers are trying to tell us that they have invented uh, some new technology but all of us understand that uh, whatever brush you take it, it it works on the same principle so uh, here we have an opportunity of uh, clean marketing and it's another kind of choice it's a choice in the field of eco projects um, unfortunately mass market has this huge pressure with strong marketing messages could you share a bit about your story how you got to this vision yeah i have originally been an industrial uh, designer i'm launching products on kickstarter and i faced uh, the idea that each of the uh, products I developed was only created in order to be created so this was the order of some company and that that's why I created it I never had uh, any idea of what's going to happen with that project in the future if it's an electronic product it, it can last from one to five years there are also other gadgets that are only kept for a year and then thrown away and then the company as a business they they, they want to make it uh, into a 2.0 version they strengthen their collaborations uh, but still it's a one use uh, product so the company starts to develop something else and in the end we are using the resources we are uh, producing this three zero five zero and other zero products and we are not given anything back as an example let's take eyeglasses in half a year you decide that you just want to have new eyeglasses it's a good desire okay but uh, this is the essence of consumerism buying just for the sake of buying in the same way sometimes designers do design just for the sake of uh, designing something so here is an example of uh, an um, iPhone flashlight uh, uh, photographic flash so this is something that we wanted to uh, introduce uh, in the uh, uh, Apple uh, store so we developed everything according to the guidelines but now when I think back of it uh, we didn't even think of the materials what kind of paper is going to use what kind of materials and even Apple itself it did not mention a single word about uh, uh, environmental uh, friendliness etc right now when new packaging is being developed it, it starts from the issue of uh, recycled paper or recycled anything because it is something that has to be done so 
five years ago we didn't even think of uh, utilization of product in the future or where it's gonna go whether it's gonna go to uh, uh, the landfill or uh, for some kind of recycling no one was worried about that so right now we are thinking in terms of new materials and this is how I came up with the idea so here is an example of uh, uh, good is less in design functionality of the product is something that defines how the product is going to look our vision is that it's the future of design the designers will understand their responsibility before us before the environment before the planet and as previous speakers have mentioned designers to an extent are, are the ones who are guilty of the fact that we are uh, consuming so much so the fewer materials you use uh, the uh, simpler your design is uh, the more it can be attractive uh, and uh, the more responsible it is so previously the task was to create a beautiful shape right now here is an, uh, an example from the big company uh, here you can see their product from 1970 and uh, the product of 2020 the first is still uh, being produced it's made of plastics but the second one is uh, made of iron so uh, previously they marketed the fact that it's a one-time uh, use product but right now the designers have to understand what kind of materials they are using to make sure that uh, the parts at least the parts of this product are able to be recycled so right now big products consist of a wooden part and uh, iron part and they are more or less environmentally friendly so this is uh, the kind of uh, problem the designer is thinking about how to use uh, the minimum amount of material and how to make uh, them easy to disconnect for recycling and uh, this is what we discussed with Tatiana Solovey uh, the question was do new materials have to look different from what existed before uh, do we have to uh, manufacture eco leather in such a way that it uh, looks like uh, regular leather that's a question that does not have the right answer and this is a task of designers at major corporations in our toothbrushes we decided to give some of the feel of uh, paper although it was possible to uh, avoid this feel but for us it was important to mm, uh, convey this value that we have uh, the value of uh, producing something environment friendly so you are able to wake up to brush your teeth uh, with environmental uh, friendly toothbrush and after that you start thinking maybe you, you you need to recycle something else to reuse something else and uh, this is how we bring in philosophy uh, that is behind our work and we believe that this is the core of activity of a modern designer so I believe that we need to bring in this feeling of something new a new material so that uh, the person can feel it and speaking of the difference between uh, the regular products and the products uh, created with the use of recycled materials of course there is a difference uh, between the home use and mass market we all understand that there are some wonderful examples of using waste to make uh, vases etc but uh, I believe it's a mass market uh, which is a major polluter and which has the major impact so 
this is uh, showing an example how major brands can do it in a powerful way. Uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, this charger can be made out of uh, recycled plastics. It's that's a material that's already available in China and once once you are selecting material uh, you are going to make your product from it's automatically available everywhere it's business um, and in Ukraine unfortunately we are still discussing whether business has to think about this but worldwide there is an increasingly clear understanding of this thank you so much for your attention and uh, Hopefully, green is a new black. Thank you so much. So, everyone who is still in this hall, you are my heroes. Thank you so much for this. Please uh, stay with us for five more minutes. Uh, we don't have time for discussion anymore because uh, the presentations were quite in-depth. I would like to suggest that all of our speakers uh, share some final word for business. Let's let's start with Darius if you are still yes, with us. I'm very happy to say, um, first of all, uh, think about this: that uh, circularity is the future. Uh, I talked a lot about systemic change. But it doesn't need to start with the system. It can start small. So in the companies, think uh, about your waste which you produce. Do I need to produce so much waste? Uh, can I avoid certain waste? Maybe someone needs my waste. Can I change uh, uh, the raw materials? Uh, can I uh, produce leaner and cheaper and with less energy? These are basic questions. Regulation is coming. Extended producers' responsibility. Don't ask yourself a question. Am I ready to take responsibility for my production? If yes, maybe I can offer different services. So start small, think big. Future is coming and be ready for this. Thank you so much, Darius. And uh, right now I will give the floor to Alina Sekalenko, who is uh, the head of Association of Sustainable Development in Ukraine. Uh, please, can we get some light? Okay, we cannot. So, uh, uh, Alina, I know that you have things to share with us. Thank you so much. Yes, I will speak in Ukrainian. So, uh, indeed, I'm very glad. Uh, uh, I'm very glad that we did not have enough time for me to speak because uh, this shows the importance of the subject of st sustainability. Everyone had a uh, lot of things to say. I was afraid we will have lots of greenwashing, but uh, fortunately we didn't. So uh, this shows uh, the development of our consciousness. I fully support Darius uh, in his idea that future is now. If you want to stay on the market, you have to change today because of the regulations, because of the Green Deal, which is already with us. So if you are ready for it, you will be successful. Otherwise please make your first steps. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alina. Those who would like to learn more about this subject or speak to Alina or to her colleagues uh, beside this hall, uh, uh, beside the little Eindhoven that we have here, uh, you will see the banner and you will be able to talk to representatives of the association. Uh, big businesses are following uh, this path not because they love penguins. Um, maybe they love penguins, but they love their business more. For instance, PepsiCo company is uh, announcing that it's uh, not uh, going to uh, you know, work with any supplier if they are not uh, zero emission. Nike and other companies are following suit. So 
we are here in Ukraine, we have lots of uh, talents, resources, we have freedom, but we should not imagine that Green Deal is somewhere far away because countries are signing these agreements, they are, are introducing these regulations and everyone who works with them, everyone who wants to sell to those countries has to follow the same principles. Even if uh, the legislation is uh, not changing, we still have to change. We have to change even now. So look for designers who can work with those new materials. Look for those who can develop new products and materials. And uh, the last final word uh, is uh, shared with us by Tatiana. I believe that since uh, I have faced this personally, all of us will be saved by investments into research and experts. Thanks to research, new solutions are being found, new products are being developed, uh, new products from uh, recycled paper, and those unusual and trivial uh, research are a combination that uh, produce new product uh, with new value for uh, the consumer. Thank you. In Turkey they have a rule. Once a business person earns enough money, uh, they build a new school. In Ukraine, each businessman can build a research center for designers. It would be wonderful. Tatiana, I will continue. Uh, I'd like to wish all of you to change uh, uh, our mindsets, to ch look for designers that can create value for your product. Thank you. The mycelium people who are going to travel to Paris. Any final word? Yes, I, I will catch up with uh, the previous speakers. We have two main messages in our startup. The first message is that future is now. It is already happening and it does require changes in our mindset. So please do not be afraid and please do not expect for someone to bring uh, solutions to you. Test your hypothesis, uh, uh, let it be confirmed or uh, not, but look for new materials. Mycelium, hemp, uh, I, I don't know, test with everything. And even if you are not successful, continue experimenting. And our second message is about sustainability. Sustainability is not about uh, only what you make, but it's also about how you make. Even your relationships uh, have to be sustainable. So Tatiana showed some uh, panels, some plastic panels that make sustainable uh, products, and they contacted us for making some packaging for their product. So uh, they want to make a sustainable panel in a sustainable packaging. That is an example for your business. Rihanna, can you add anything? I believe you have lots of things to say. Yes, well, I uh, am totally impressed by all these wonderful uh, presentations and, and your drive and your spirit. And uh, I think you are a big example also for Austria. I think we can learn a lot from you and we can be inspired by you. So I really think we should cooperate and do more together. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks. We will help you cooperate with our designers. Uh, and uh, have, have I given the floor to everyone? Effa has shared what they wanted to share. Okay. So, uh, a brief announcement which you could have seen on social media already on the 1st of uh, September uh, the founder of U Future company uh, Vasil Khmelnytsky has signed a memorandum of uh, cooperation with uh, the network of uh, UN and he has become a social ambassador of this association and here we uh, have uh, the director of UN's Global Deal, Tatiana Sakharuk. I would like to give the floor to Tatiana. So yes, we were ready to 
jump up with our entire team, but let's be brief. The UN system traditionally was uh, interacting with uh, the social uh, field and uh, also uh, the national governments. But uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, we realized that it's impossible to solve global issues without interaction with business. So we have uh, uh, n uh, created a new initiative, Global Compact, which uh, involves, uh, uh, which invites businesses uh, that build uh, their uh, companies uh, on sustainability principles. EFA is one of the recently joined companies and we are proud to have you with us. This is uh, one of the examples we are proud to share with the world showing how Ukraine can uh, implement a sustainable development uh, in their projects and conquer global markets. Here in Ukraine, just as everywhere, we work to get business on board in order to implement sustainable development goals. We have almost 100 companies with us already. We keep growing. We sometimes have several companies uh, joining us in a single day. Our task is to grow even faster, is to have uh, all the Ukrainian business uh, involved and according to UN statistics businesses which build their work on sustainable development uh, uh, goals uh, they grow two or three times faster those of you who have been to the first part of this event and who have heard from uh, Vasil Khmelnytsky uh, you understand that uh, uh, they uh, were able to get investments thanks to being eco-friendly and uh, they are able to get loans on better conditions. So there is a financial component behind that. Business can earn money if uh, they package these solutions right and if they uh, inform uh, their clients about these solutions. I'm very uh, grateful to the cases we uh, have heard about today it will uh, create a foundation for uh, business to uh, rethink their products and to implement them together. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. And once again, after this panel, you can approach Tatiana and Alina. They are ambassadors of sustainable uh, development. And here I would ask uh, uh, to show our QR code uh, on the screen. And uh, this fall we uh, will offer a series of creative session, uh, sessions designed to business. You will learn a lot about new products and you will have a wonderful time. That's the end of our panel. Uh, thank you so much our dear speakers and our dear audience.